Good evening and welcome to the community. One, two. Good evening and welcome to the community spotlight. I'm Cheryl Girl and we're going to have some fun tonight. Now, you know, we always have interesting guests and tonight we got a brother up here that you see on TV all the time. I mean, I swear every time I turn on, <laughs> on the news, anything, I look up and I see Brother John Barnett the second. How are you doing? Doing good. How you doing? I'm doing great. Doing now, good. you know... How we go way, way, mm -hmm. way back. Mm -hmm. Power way back. Street yeah. team. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. We go Nate Quick back. Yeah, that's right. That's and the right. thing about it, you have stayed fast in in, in 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 what you do. You've always been outspoken. You've always stood up for the underdog. And I just want to commend you for so many years of being uh, a civil rights activist here in the community, and not just here in Charlotte, but really all over. Now, there's a title, they get, what do they call you? The Prince of Civil Rights? Yeah, the Civil Rights the, CEO? Yeah, that's what they label you. Yeah. <laughs> well, Prince. John, you got to take me back a little bit, because uh, in reading your bio, I learned some things I didn't know. Of course, I, I see you standing in front of the courtroom, um, you know, being vigilant and, and, and find, you know, standing up for people here in the Queen City, but take me back to what initially made you want to, to, to be that person, to do the marching? Uh, I think it's a number of things, three in particular. Um, mm -hmm. I think in 92, when I opened up Malcolm X's autobiography, like my whole, my whole view of the world had changed. And I later heard that Spike Lee and Heavy D had that same impact over the book. Mm -hmm. um, secondly was my brother's shooting death, my cousin, uh, shot my brother in the back over an oh. argument over a pair of tennis shoes. It was in 94. Are you serious? Yes, and it was in Clover, South Carolina. Oh. Uh, I was in church. When I got home, my brother was laying on the ground pretty much because my grandmother had said there had been some shooting. So I went, went around the road to see what was going on. He was laying on the ground, and unfortunately, I watched him take his last breath. Um, a year later... That, that is really, uh, you know, mm -hmm. horrible to hear. Yeah. How old were you? I was uh, probably 26. 26. 26. Yes. Okay. And... Um, a year later, the Million Man March came about, and on that day, uh, there was there was um, Russell Simmons was there, right? Uh, Reverend Sharpton, Jesse Jackson, Minister Farrakhan, um, and Johnny Cochran. And that day, they Minister Farrakhan told us to go home and write one brother in prison. But I didn't know five years later I'd be eating dinner with all those individuals. So wow. I later started working by working diligently in writing inmates in jail. North Carolina has 31,000 inmates and 19,000 are black. South Carolina's number three in the country with the most blacks in jail, 27. So wait a minute, wait. Go, you're running past these numbers really mm -hmm. fast. North Carolina has how many they black 30, inmates? 31,000 inmates and 19,000 are black men. That's like a whole city. Yes, and South Carolina's number three in the country with the most blacks in jail. There's 27,000 inmates and 17,000 are black and nine are my best friends which kind of motivated me to write my friends in jail. Um, in 2002, I wrote Reverend Sharpton in jail. I didn't think he was gonna write me back. He was getting letters from Michael Jackson, Johnny Cochran, and inmates. But and John Barnett, apparently. John, yeah, what I did, I put his picture on the back of the envelope. I was working at a mail room in Charlotte mm -hmm. at Kraft Foods, like riding around with a little mail cart. Mm -hmm. And uh, I sent three letters, symbolic to my brother being shot three times. And wow. he opened up the letter and invited me to New York City. Um, I spoke live in front of C-SPAN. Wow. Um, and then that started my relationship with Reverend Sharpton for seven years, which he kind of taught me how to do civil rights. I mean, but that's just, it's just amazing. Now, you talked about nine friends mm -hmm. being in jail in your bio. I read that you, were, you served in the military. Yes. And that's when you found out that so many of your childhood friends had gone to jail. That's correct. When I got, I went in the military in 88. Right. Uh, in 91, when I got out, nine of my friends were either headed to prison or in prison um, for drugs and stuff of that nature. And... Uh, I later studied on why black, so many black men go to jail, and it was because of the fact that they said that they didn't have or don't have a loving father in the home. And even my father was in the home, but my grandmother raised me. Right. So when I look at my nine friends, all of their fathers were absent, which is probably part of the problem that we have with the youth in the streets of Charlotte today. Hill Harper told Monique that in 1976, 71% of black men or fathers were active in their children's lives, or there was an uncle or a pastor present somewhere in the neighborhood. And he said, now the number's down to 31%. Like, you might not be able to find a black man walking with his family at Freedom Park. Wow. And so part of our problem in Charlotte with the black-on-black -black crime is that we need more fathers. And um, it's, it's, it's an urgent need that we do that. Million Man March, we just got back last week from the Million Man March. Well, um, let's talk about, okay, the name of your, it's, it's 
what does Thug Ministry stand for? What Thug, does Thug it, stand it for? Actually, it started out as Thug Ministry because right. I was writing inmates, and that's all I was doing. Okay. And then when I met Reverend Sharpton, I revamped it just to Thug because it wasn't Thug. actually a ministry. And it stands for? It stands for True Healing Under God. True Healing Under God. That's because correct. I sort of had the misconception. I don't know what I thought. I just thought, okay, let's all get together. Some white cops shot some black kids. Mm -hmm. John Barnett's going to be out there marching. But really, is it's the which in itself is huge. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But you had there is there's more to it. Yes, yes. We actually I, the basis about to do is is help families um, get access to attorneys. That's what we've been doing for the last three years. Um, we turn small cases uh, into a big camera lens. Jonathan Farrell's case would not have gotten the exposure it got if it wasn't for the things that Reverend Sharpton taught me, which is doing two things that James Brown taught him. He said, if you want to expose crack houses in 1991, Reverend Sharpton, um, do two things, do what I do in soul music. And he said, be loud and be dramatic. Be loud and be dramatic. And, and I never forgot that. So, you know, when we do court patrol for Jonathan Farrell, you know, I ask like 50 people to come to court. It's different, but they can't stop us from going in. It's a public building, but it worked. And now we ended up getting, you know, the Hispanic group came and, you know, it, mm -hmm. it made a big momentum. And uh, even though it came into a mistrial, you know, the family was rewarded $2.25 million. But how do you really feel about that? Uh, it's upsetting because, um, you know, I think that when, when you look at, I've never seen a white female or a white male be shot down 51 times like Sean Bell in New York. Never mm -hmm. seen a white female, white male be shot down 10 times like Jonathan Farrell and get shot at 12 times. So it appears that when, when you're black, you're blessed with this chocolate skin, mm -hmm. there's a little more extra that comes to it. They, they seem to be a little more excessive with us. And uh, it doesn't make sense. And I think that um, he should have been charged and sent to prison. And the numbers of cops going to prison for shooting us is, is like less than five. And I think I read something that you had posted recently that he had petitioned to have his Something about his record. Yes, um, yes. Uh, since we ha are in a mistrial, and keep in, keep in mind a mistrial is like a draw in baseball. No one won. Farrell family didn't win. He didn't win. But we, it wasn't strong. And now he is? He is uh, Officer Carrick. Okay. And uh, so we just wasn't strong enough for us to charge him. Four uh, voted guilty and eight not guilty. Um, so in saying that, since we weren't able to charge him, it's like a dismissal. So if you go to court, police pull you over for no reason, like Milton Dunlap, he was a young man that was pulled over in Charlotte, um, arrested. And if it's dismissed, you can get your record expunged. Really? Based off that paperwork saying that it's dismissed. And so the mistrial is symbolic. Even though there's someone dead. That's correct, that's correct. Because even though he's dead, they felt as though he needed to shoot Jonathan Fair because he ran toward him, I guess. And that's why it's in a mistrial. But if we had got you know, some charges on him, then he would not have been able to do that. So now he's able to get an expungement. It will not be seen unless you Google him. So if there's an employee that want to hire Officer Carrick tomorrow for a police department in Gastonia or a security job, then he can actually get that job based on the fact that he's going to get his record expunged. And he's also getting a check this week for like $120,000. And what, what is the check for? That was for the two or three years we've been waiting to go to court. But that was, his, I, I'm thinking, his salary oh for those goodness. years. So when you see something like this, I mean, I don't know, do you think he'll be able to work as a police officer again? No, not at all. No, no. Um, but will he need to? Because people know his name, like with George Zimmerman, with people knowing the name I, and the notoriety. I, I, and I think he'll you be. You almost become. Yeah, he'll be just like you know, George Zimmerman, I believe. He, can't even go, he probably can't even go into a gas station. Um, and so in saying that, I remember Bishop Kevin Long preaching about Cain and Abel. And then when Cain, when Cain killed Abel, he said Cain walked around aimlessly like, lost. And that's kind of how George Zimmerman is. And then I heard Minister Farrakhan say that, you know, America thinks that O.J. killed Nicole Simpson. He said, so even if O.J. Simpson killed her, he said, O.J. may escape man's law, but he can't escape God's law. So, you know, there's something called a conscience. Yes. And there's something called, I'm sleeping at night and I'm hearing 10 shots and I'm seeing Jonathan Farrell's face. I don't know if, if I was to kill someone. My own brother who my cousin that killed my brother, he, even he has those same thoughts that, and dreams that, you know, I killed someone. So his conscience should be eating it up, eating him up. And um, mm -hmm. th there was a lot of flaws in the case. I don't want to get too much into the case. Tell, if, if, I mean, you know, this your chance, you better tell what yeah, you want to tell. I mean, tell. you know, like, because like, like, how do you not have the man that charged him not be in court? Like, I called Chief Monroe, the mystery man, who's now doing security for Coca-Cola in Florida. 
So all these games were played. And I people noticed there was a, some interesting timing there. Yes, yes. I yeah. think, you know, cutting, most people win lawsuits after the trial. Rodney King got beat. They didn't want to lock the cops up. Right. We burnt down the city. They gave Rodney King two million. Okay. With the Farrell case, it took two years. So they wanted Charlotte to forget about the man named Jonathan Farrell, mm -hmm. right? Because we tend to have amnesia. They cut the check 2.25 million before we go to court, 30 days prior. So a lot of people are like, okay. Yeah, but the court date was like, I think July 19th. Right. July 1st, Chief Monroe retires, oh. right? Mm -hmm. Goes to Florida doing security, Coca-Cola. So what happens is they took two years to try to figure out how are we gonna strategically do this? And I guess they game plan to so many words uh, worked for them as far as getting this officer Well, off. now, one of the things I was saying is that, John, you've always been out there marching and making people aware. Um, you know, I, I, I could get information from you on Facebook and Twitter, Instagram, that I, that I wasn't getting from, you know, mainstream media. Mm -hmm. And so, first of all, thank you for letting us know a lot of the things that they, we, we wouldn't mm -hmm. have heard about. Uh, and just the fact that you, you keep going back. So, you were talking earlier about some of the things that Al Sharpton had taught you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, because I follow you, what is the popcorn... Um, activist. <laughs> activist. Explain that to okay. me. Yeah, I've been using Because you've been in the trenches for a minute, yeah. so you're not popcorn. Yeah, I, I think I ju I'm just truly blessed that God has allowed me to be full-time in civil rights, mm -hmm. which means six years ago I quit my job, and now we, we have a thousand members in nine states, including Ferguson and Sanford, Florida for Trayvon. Uh, we've gotten 17 people out of jail. And really? Eight, eight, so, co eight cops fired. Seventy people in Charlotte or across the country? Charlotte and surrounding areas. Rockingham, I threatened the public defender, and he let the guy out the next day. So, so when you threaten... Uh, this, I don't really this, threaten. Well, no, but when you, when you are you bad enough to step up and say, you know, you're doing wrong, we want attention to this, how does that impact you on a personal level? Do you, you know, I would be nervous. In fact, my whole feeling of all these things, the way so many things have uh, jumped off in the last couple of years, about how African Americans are treated, even mm -hmm. how women are treated, mm -hmm. I sort of feel nervous if there's a blue light popping up beside yeah. me. And I used to feel a different way. Yeah, I grew up in a neighborhood called Oak Ridge and Clover, and uh -huh. there was winos around me, and people getting shot, and people getting stabbed, and I got nine friends in prison. And it's called, my organization called Thug for a reason. So I think God was able, to, able God was allowing me to able to see all those images mm -hmm. to build a form of courage. Tupac said, "Thug is not someone who wants to rob you." He said, "Thug is is symbolic to courage." And so I guess when you see death, I'm watching my brother die. I've seen people get shot. Um, you tend to be numb to fear. And I, I think what happens is when you win, like when I got the first person out of jail, it motivated me to get somebody else out of jail because I'm like, right. hey, people are being falsely accused. So who was the first person that you got out um, of jail? First person was. Um, God, it was four black men in Alabama. I went to Alabama, mm -hmm. and they was accused of shooting a cop at a gas station. And uh -huh. somebody in the crowd did it. And so we were able to get those guys out of jail. And then Michael Cherry was arrested by the Cornelius Police Department. They, he sat in jail for 27 months in Charlotte. Um, you can see that on WSOC. Mm -hmm. uh, you can Google it to the day. Tanika Smith did a story on that. And um, they said they found a beer bottle in the yard, and he had his DNA on it. And later we found out they didn't even do the DNA testing. So oh, Michael really? Cherry sat in jail for 27 months, and we were able to get him out. And how old was he? Three days. He's like 30, 32 years old. It's just crazy. Yeah, so. It's, it's you know, one of the running themes that, that I'm getting from you is we're talking about our community mm -hmm. and, and our brothers and, and brothers stepping up. What, what's your advice to, to a young man right now? If you're, you know, you're just living your life, just trying to do what you do, and, th you, and you get stopped by the police. Yeah. What, what should mothers and fathers be telling their kids, and what should we do yeah, well, to be prepared? Because well, I'm were, nervous. Well, it takes a whole village to raise a child, but if mm -hmm. the whole village is crazy, listening to Nicki Minaj, then mm -hmm. it's going to produce a crazy child. <laughs> so I think we... We, but okay, we can't blame all the ill society on yeah, Nicki Minaj. That's true, that's well, okay. true. I, just, I thought I'd just throw that out there <laughs> for the popcorn activists. Okay, for the po okay we got to get back to I'm okay. sorry. <laughs> popcorn activists is those that pop up when, when something has happened. Let's say, for instance, Jonathan Farrell case. We had been working on the case for two years, and mm -hmm. in the end, everybody started popping up out of everywhere, doing different things, doing rallies here and rallies there. It's kind of offensive to us who are real civil rights activists mm -hmm. um, because they're only there for a moment, because I'm full-time, which means I wake up in the morning, and I'm meeting a lawyer that's coming here, a millionaire lawyer. I'm meeting him in the morning at 10 o'clock, mm -hmm. and my next step is to help this mother whose son just stole a car. That's my schedule for tomorrow. Right. For the activists that 
I staged these different rallies, they go to work. And so you got to understand that when Dr. King went, became an activist, it was only seven days after Rosa Parks was denied her seat on the bus. And Jesse Jackson, Andrew Young, and others, and Stokely Carmichael said, Dr. King, we want to put you in front of this movement. So if it wasn't for Rosa Parks going to jail, Dr. Mm -hmm. King would never exist. So seven days later, he became full time in civil rights. I mean, but and so what do you happened, have to be full time? I mean, no, is, no, there, is there no good well, part to the, the I, popcorn? I think what happens is, is that I'm a, I'm a member of the NWCP okay. in Gastonia. And when someone calls you and their son has been shot on Friday night mm. and you don't call them back for three weeks, we got a problem. Oh, that, that's a big problem. It's a big problem. And so right now, I think, um, and I'm just giving real numbers, my mentor, Charles White, who used to be with the NWCP, said last year that 13,000 people did not renew their membership. So it's almost like the NWCP, to a certain extent, is like a Baptist church. And people our age, 25 and 40, and this is factual, mm -hmm. are not attending or connected to those entities. They're joining New Life or, or a bigger mega church. So my mother's church is suffering right now. It's 30 people in a Mount Zion church in Gastonia. So okay, everyone, everyone's that's left. a bit of a stretch for me, that mm -hmm. analogy. Um, the whole church and, and the NAACP. Because, well, so let me ask you this. We, you know, if we talk about popcorn activists and we talk about people who've been in the mm -hmm. trenches, you know, to me, there's got to be some kind of middle ground be some, be, be, between somebody who pops up feeling motivated by the moment mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and those people who've been there forever. But also, you can't discount those people who have been in the trenches who, who are not effective we anymore. So we let don't. me ask you that. How do you get all those together? How do you get them sparked we, into to being part of it? The first thing you do, I, I, I think it's challenging because there's steps to civil rights. You got to know what a press release is. Okay. And you have to be able to mobilize the people first. If you notice in the 60s, Malcolm X and Dr. King, they spoke to the people in the church first. And then he would say, we're going to march on this day. And sometime the popcorn activists will right. do the march first when you haven't even mobilized the people first. Okay, but if people aren't going to church like they used to, what else can we do? Because honestly, yeah. I, I don't go to, like when I was growing up in Salisbury, church, you every you Sunday, back no twice, we'd go to Sacred Heart in the morning for his Calvary in mm -hmm. the afternoon. But that's not my reality now. Social, a lot of people are not in church. Yeah. So where do we get to them? Social media has helped a lot. I've met so Social many. media is the new church. It's the so, new <laughs> so, yeah, they're, they're watching church on TV now True. and on internet. So you have to use, you have to be creative. And that's mm -hmm. again goes back to the old traditions. If you are an organization and mm -hmm. you're not connected to social media, you don't have a Twitter page, you have to get with what's going on. No, we don't we don't play eight tracks anymore. No. We're playing CDs. And so not even that, we're just downloading it. Ex exactly. People get rid of their CDs. So, so when you got a church that's still got an eight track mindset, but the majority of your congregation has a CD mindset, then there's not a connection, and we got to get those individuals connected. There was an interesting story they did in National Geographic. Mm -hmm. They had all the African elephants in a tribe, and they sounded alarm, and they would go eat, let's say around 5 o'clock. So what they did, they took all the father elephants out of the tribe. The only ones left was the mothers and the young youthful elephants. I call them the Simbas. Within two or three weeks, the youthful elephants, when they would sound alarm to go eat, would hit the mothers with their trunks. That's symbolic to how the single mothers are raising all of our boys in Charlotte. Crime is high, but I'm almost certain that almost 80% of the young black boys that go to jail every night, that's highlighted on the news, right. do, do not have a loving father in the home. And what they did for four, three to four months, those youthful elephants had taken over the tribe. Now, about the fifth month, they brought these elephants back in. So imagine your father, all of these men in prison. Mm -hmm. We had 1.9 million men in prison. Louisiana has 71% black men in jail. They're number one. Right? Imagine all those fathers coming back home. Even if June Bug wasn't working, at least he's able to be in that home to tell his son right from wrong. And so part of our problem dealing with all this crime, especially with these, I mean, I've seen 20 faces in the last three days on the news of young black males robbing, shooting. One lady was at our mailbox last night, mm -hmm. two nights ago, 11.30 at night, and a 16-year-old comes up behind her with a gun, you know, and steals a car. That's just crazy. And, and so it's imperative that the mothers can't do it alone. The sisters, we got to get the brothers to step back up. Um, and the men Can have the to step back up. Can the sisters get the brothers to, to, to step back up? I, I believe that. Because that, that, um, I think if that was the, it, to me that sounds like an easy solution. Mm -hmm. It's not as easy. But, but I don't think that's been working. Brothers have got to get brothers yeah, to step up. Yeah, it's a vicious cycle because you got to realize some of the brothers are in jail. 
some are on probation. Okay, so if you know. got brothers in jail, and that's what their real life situation is in, in this moment, mm -hmm. what can someone in that position do to still be a viable voice in their household with their children? They can't really change their mindset unless the whole village comes together. Mm -hmm. And what does that mean? If the sister can't go to the jail and visit the brother, the pastor should go. Hebrews 13 and 3 says, remember those who are in prison as if you're in prison yourself. So the whole tribe symbolically has to come together I have, and I help just have to ask, have you ever been in prison? No, no, I haven't, no. I'm I got, just wondering, I, yeah. but because you have so many friends yeah, I and got, family who yes, have. Yeah, nine friends in prison. One, mm -hmm. one of my friends just got out last week. His name is um, Sean Bailey. And uh, he's been Did in, you just do a shout out? Shout yeah, out I just shout out to Sean <laughs> in Oak Ridge. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but he's he been in for 13 years. Wow. 13 years. Well, God bless him. Yeah, so he's Make out. It through. And he's going to be working with us, you know. So it's imperative that we grab their hands when they, when they get out. So there's just so much work that has to be done. Mm -hmm. So now, what? Now you said you went to the Million Man March. Mm -hmm. Was this the 20th? This was the 20th anniversary. 20th anniversary yes. of it. And what was that like? That was last weekend? Yeah, it was last week. Tell me about October that. 10th. It was it was very powerful. Well, not as powerful as 1995. Okay. Because it was kind of different. I didn't, go, I didn't go, of course, they said for the women to stay home. Yes. I did take the work day off from First Union. Mm -hmm. Laid on the couch and watched it. It was a beautiful thing. In 95? You mean 95? Um, yes. Okay, okay. And then I went to the, the Million, million Women March, Women March okay. in Philly, and then I went to the Million Family March Me with uh, J with uh, BJ mm -hmm. Murphy and the whole crew mm -hmm. from Power 98 mm -hmm. Broadcast Live. So in 2015, what was it like to be there? It was just as powerful. Mm -hmm. um, and it still amazes me how you can get, uh, I'm sure it was 400,000 people there. Mm -hmm. No fights. No fights. No arguments. It, you can't really explain and it's sad because that energy to people who, who've never been in that positive type of yeah. environment. And I think it's sad. In 95, you had different stations running it, like CNN. And, but this time, the only station, the only little camera was there that was there was C-SPAN. Wow. So they knew this one was, was going to be very impactful. Black Lives Matter concept is growing um, at, a, at, a, at a rapid rate. And so um, I think what we learned that day is that we need to deal with that justice or else. And we don't have any choice. America's falling. Um, I got friends not only in prison, but with college degrees, not working, you know. So when you say justice or else, or else what is, or else? The else means that we. Threat or else? No, I don't think despair it's. Despair or I, I, else? It's almost like what else are you going to do? We're already dying. They're already locking us up at a rapid rate. Mm -hmm. Public schools not working. CMS is fussing right now downtown. Um, and I think what we, we, for years we've actually followed American, this American dream. And the dream for us, especially for me, is like a nightmare. And that's just a harsh reality. Power 98, well, let's say let's, 20 years ago, I had about 15, 20 friends there. It's down to two now. Mm -hmm. So Power 98 is symbolic to my friends graduate from college and cannot find a job. They're at the temp service. Wow. And so since we see this country falling, we're in debt. I think Minister Farrakhan said we're so many trillions in debt that if you put a hundred dollar bill on the ground and stack it to the moon, that's how much we're in debt. <laughs> you know, they do the numbers and the mathematics. Right. So um, I think it's imperative that we just get back to the 80s were perfect. Michael Jackson Thriller was on the radio, not a bunch of rap music that we don't know what they're saying. Mm -hmm. We had family reunions. We went to Sunday school. <laughs> yes, you know, right. And I, and I think we, but in 2015, 2015, John Barnett II, yes. you've been out there doing this for so long. I need you to leave us with, with some, some working steps. What are five things that or at least just even two things that, that somebody watching Community Spotlight tonight could do that would be supportive to, to, to um your organization, mm -hmm. to our community, to these brothers in prison. What, can, what are some of the things we can well, do? Well, the first thing is, I think when you, when you look at Michael Jackson, Whitney Houston, and Tupac, they all three had something in common. They always talked about God. Whitney and they also died of, well, no, Tupac didn't die from a drug of death. Okay. No, no, yeah. See, okay, yeah, all but, right. But we're not say. even on the drug of death. Okay. I'm talking about, you know, the Michael that we knew talked about God. Being an instrument for God. So we got to talk about God. We got to get God back in we the got equation. To get, it's okay. imperative. I mean, I would. I don't just go out in front of a courthouse knowing that cops are across the street and, 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 and good old boys are walking around with Confederate flags around me and gas on you if I didn't, if I wasn't connected to God. So it's more than just a job. Yes. This is 
It's a passion, like it's a calling. I wake up. It is, but when you say a calling, a calling from God. Yes, yes. Because I've gotten several confirmations, and, and confirmations mm -hmm. if you, on a spiritual level is I don't think God would allow me to watch my brother die. How did I end up at the Million Man March? Beside MC Hammer, years later, I'm, I'm at Michael Jackson's funeral. I'm, I'm sorry, James Brown's funeral. Mm -hmm. MC Hammer's sitting in front of me, mm -hmm. right? And now Al Sharpton's on stage and he's talking. Right. And I build this relationship with him. So I believe that people don't always believe in it, but I believe in divine intervention. Like you're here for a reason. I'm here for a reason. Me and you are doing this show. For a reason. Somebody's going to be able to hear what we're saying today mm -hmm. and their whole life may change tomorrow. Wow. Or they may, or pastor may be listening to us. And he said, I'm going to do more for, with the men in our church. I'm at least get a Facebook page at least. for the church. And so, so it's yeah. divine intervention. And I think people have to identify with that. And so we, we are all here for a reason. I'm just glad that I knew I didn't need to be the first black male man in Clover, which I was in 91. You know? Yeah, there was more. It was more. And so once you know what it is, you'll know in your heart and you get results. You get 17 people out of jail, which is literally unheard of. That is. You get, you get eight cops fired in nine different cities or seven different cities. Um, well, if no one ever said it to you, John, I appreciate your, your heart. I appreciate the work that you do. I appreciate you going out there day after day, mm -hmm. week after week, month after month, year after year. And I know a lot of people do. And if they want to know more about your organization, is there a website yes, that we can go um, to? Twitter is Twitter. at Civil Rights CEO. At Civil Rights CEO. That's correct. We're in nine states along the East Coast, um, okay. from Georgia to New York to Virginia to Florida. So if they need to contact us, our number is 803-412-6854. Okay. And uh, Facebook is Thug Civil Rights. Thug Civil Rights. So if you have, you want to help or you have a situation, you've, had, you've met the man, and I can tell you personally, he is a great dude. And I, once again, thank you for the work that mm -hmm. you've done. Thank you, thank you for coming on Community coming Spotlight. <laughs> I remember back in the day, he'd bring us snacks up at the station. Know, right? Did you bring your snacks today? No, All right, you're you going to do better than that. We got the Krispy Donuts. <laughs> no, oh, see, I knew I loved you for a reason. <laughs> and we love you for always tuning in every week to Community Spotlight. We have got more great shows coming up. Make sure that you follow us on uh, YouTube. We've got our own channel. And you can always look up Tyrone Chandler. He is the genius behind all of this. Mm -hmm. I'm Cheryl Girl. Thank you so much for letting us be part of your evening. Keep coming back to Community Spotlight. And once again, thank you, John. Okay, thank you. Thank you. You guys have a great evening.